is my time. Um, so greetings today is uh, our, our, the fi uh, this afternoon rather is the last of our three sessions on collaborative earth system, system modeling in Canada. Um, we have uh, two presentations and some and time for some discussion. Um, and uh, during the discussion, uh, Yan Ping Li, who had some technical problems at the, in, the first, in the second session, will uh, be, uh, present a, a bit more material and uh, we'll see what we have time for otherwise. So let's get started uh, with uh, Claude Michel uh, Zotin Miti Pai, uh, who's uh, going to talk tell us about linking cumulative carbon emissions with observable climate impacts. And I'll let you know when 10 minutes have passed, um, Claude Michel. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Okay, so can you all see my screen? Yes, yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, so my name is Claude Michel, you can call me CM. Um, so the title of my presentation is uh, Linking Cumulative Carbon Emissions uh, with Observable Climate Impacts. Uh, so this is more of a uh, like presentation based on literature review or review with a, a little bit of uh, Earth system uh, model uh, simulations, uh, but the talk should be uh, relevant or of interest to people using their system models. So um, uh, for over a decade now, um, uh, they, they, there has been a, like, it's a, a quite known now in the literature or in climate science that um, uh, cumulative carbon emissions uh, since pre-industrial time uh, and global warming uh, display a kind of a linear relationship and uh, this relationship uh, is very um, uh, practical and uh, useful and is robust. Um, so the relationship does not depend on the timing of our emissions or uh, the emission pathway. Uh, as shown on this figure, um, uh, from the, like, the historical period and uh, projection of at least for the next couple of decades, uh, this relationship holds and for the historical part and also the uh, different emission scenarios or SSPs. Um, so the usefulness of this uh, relationship is such that uh, we can uh, um, estimate or predict uh, the global warming level associated with every amount of uh, uh, carbon emission. Uh, so for instance, from the latest IPCC report, and it's estimated that every ton or trillion ton of uh, cumulative carbon emissions uh, contributes to warm the earth or warms the earth by about 1.7 degrees Celsius. And this quantity is generally referred to as TCRE or transient climate response to cumulative uh, carbon emissions. And here I provide the formula that can be used to estimate or calculate the TCRE. Uh, it's a ratio between uh, global warming, like changing global uh, mean surface air temperature per uh, cumulative emissions times uh, factor that accounts for a fraction of non-CO2 uh, forcings and their contribution of non-CO2 forcings to global warming. Um, so there are um, uh, probably many reasons or many benefits of identifying observable climate impacts that scale linearly with cumulative emissions. So here I, I mentioned two of them. Uh, so one uh, benefit uh, is uh, having uh, simplified predictions. Uh, for instance, in the context of uh, impact assessment. Another reason is uh, uh, regards to uh, policy implications. For, for instance, if you want to have like mitigation strategies or attribution. Um, but there are a multitude of climate impacts. Um, so for example, the latest IPCC report states that climate change is already affecting many regions of the earth in multiple ways. So we cannot venture into like uh, identifying all uh, climate impacts, but uh, there is a way of simplifying things. So there are uh, three uh, major uh, climate, climate impact can be grouped into ma three main groups. So there are climate impacts affecting physical uh, systems such as ocean, land, vegetation, cryosphere, and the atmosphere. So those can be referred to as uh, physical impacts. Uh, but there are also impacts affecting uh, organisms or species or terrestrial or marine ecosystems. Uh, so those can be referred to as biological impacts. 
And lastly, there are impacts affecting the human, like human managed uh, systems. Uh, and we call, call them societal impacts. So uh, there are two research uh, questions uh, guiding. Uh, so there are two questions guiding our research. Uh, the first one is uh, which observable climate impact uh, scale linearly with cumulative carbon emissions? And the second question is uh, what are the climate impacts of one trillion ton of uh, cumulative carbon emissions? So to um, address these questions, uh, we conducted a research review uh, using Web of Science. Uh, so conducted a search using the Web of Science. Uh, we, uh, by looking at uh, published peer review uh, research uh, with a title or topic on uh, cumulative uh, carbon emission or uh, emissions or cumulative uh, CO2 emissions. And we narrowed down those, uh, like the results of that search uh, to um, uh, studies that looked at climate impacts of cumulative uh, uh, car uh, carbon emissions. And we also considered cross uh, references uh, for like a highly relevant papers that were not uh, that were cited by many people, many of those uh, papers we found. So we also conducted uh, performed model simulations uh, using the University of Victoria Earth System climate model, uh, which is a, a Earth System model of intermediate complexity uh, illustrated with this diagram. Um, so uh, it incorporates the model incorporates uh, many uh, or Earth system components uh, that uh, exchange energy, water, and carbon when the model is running fully coupled mode. So, uh, as for the results, uh, I start by showing uh, climate impacts from uh, one uh, trillion ton of carbon emissions, uh, cumulative emissions, uh, based on the reviewed literature. So, at the global scale, uh, we find that uh, global warming scale linearly with uh, cumulative emission, as previously mentioned. Uh, so it's estimated that about 1.7 degrees, uh, so the Earth will be warmed by 1.7 degrees uh, per trillion ton of carbon. But there is also a linear relationship uh, between land surface warming globally and uh, cumulative emissions. Uh, and the warming for land is slightly higher than global average. And the, the warming for the sea surface is also scaled linearly with cumulative emission. And the estimate is uh, that uh, um, surface, sea surface uh, uh, warming will be slightly lower than uh, global average for surface air. Um, for regions, for different regions, uh, we find that regional warming uh, scale linearly with cumulative emission in many regions. And we, the big picture is that uh, the northern high latitude will warm uh, at least uh, more relatively like twice as, uh, a little higher than the global average. Uh, tropical regions will warm slightly higher. They, are, they experience warming slightly higher than surface, like global average. And the southern uh, region, the southern hemisphere regions, uh, we uh, warm relatively the same as uh, global average in terms of surface air temperature. Um, but there are also extreme uh, daytime and nighttime uh, warming that scale linearly with global warming, uh, with cumulative carbon emissions. And uh, uh, generally, the estimates are slightly higher than global uh, warming. And that's the case. Uh, there's more warming when you go to the regional scale, and uh, many a couple of regions, so the Arctic, Northern Asia, Mediterranean basin, uh, Southern Hemisphere, Brazil, and Southern Africa. They also they all experience a kind of uh, warming that scale, like daytime and nighttime warming that scale linearly with cumulative carbon emissions. Um, uh, there are also results showing that uh, the Arctic sea ice extent will decline, like the ice, Arctic sea ice uh, will decline linearly with cumulative emissions. And the estimate for September decline is uh, about uh, 8. Uh, 0.8 square kilometer uh, per uh, ton of cumulative emissions. So uh, also heavy precipitation events, uh, globally scale linear with cumulative emissions and uh, Globally, there's an increase of 10% estimated for trillion, one trillion ton of climatic emissions. When we go at the regional scale, we find that, uh, for example, the uh, West and North, uh, North America, so the Pacific region, will experience a 5% increase in global warming in heavy precipitation per trillion ton of carbon. 
And um, uh, monsoon regions of West Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, we also experience a heavy precipitation increase uh, per one trillion ton of carbon that is relatively cost, uh, substantial. Uh, at the global scale, there is also uh, seasonal precipitation changes uh, for like December, January, February, or June, July, August. There's also projected uh, mean sea level rise uh, that scale linearly with uh, cumulative emissions. And lastly, there is uh, estimate of labor productivity loss in terms of GDP. Uh, so the productivity loss associated with uh, exported, like extreme heat exposure, especially in sectors such as uh, manufacturing, uh, agriculture, mining, and so on. So um, from the previous slide, a few uh, studies consider money and climate impact. And so we use our model uh, simulation. So results from our model to explore what marine impact may, may scale linearly with cumulative emissions. So we found that global system first temperature, uh, obviously, a scale linearly with cumulative emission, but there is also um, a change in global sea ice extent. Previously, I showed the uh, sea ice extent in the Arctic only and in September. Um, so here I show globally. And there is also total ocean temperature, uh, but then there is also sea surface uh, pH. So from our Just, estimate- Sorry, CM, you have, um, you have about uh, uh, four minutes left. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. So, um, so from our model, uh, we estimated that uh, uh, sea surface temperature will increase uh, uh, well, like one point by 1.4 degrees Celsius per trillion ton of carbon, and global sea ice uh, extent with the time uh, by about three uh, trillion square kilometers per one trillion ton of carbon, and global uh, ocean warming uh, would be slightly lower, like considerably lower than sea surface temperature, which makes sense that because there's ocean mixing and uh, when considering the entire ocean depth, so warming would be slightly lower. And then there is uh, also a pH declining by 1.1 uh, uh, per 1 trillion ton of carbon, giving a hint uh, that uh, ocean acidification may also scale linearly with uh, cumulative carbon emissions. Um, so is there a way of generalizing this concept and finding many more observable climate impact? Uh, so here we propose a way of uh, trying to find more uh, climate effect impact that scale linearly with cumulative carbon emissions. Uh, so, building on the fact that uh, many uh, observable climate impact uh, scale linearly with global warming. And this has been uh, part of the literature since at least the IPCC, like the Paris Agreement. And um, we found that a couple of impacts, such as uh, heat waves, the terrestrial and marine heat waves, mortality due to extreme heat and cold exposure. Uh, extreme sea level events such as coastal storm, storm surges, drought, uh, river flooding, so their frequencies, the crop, crop duration, at least for selected coal, they all scale linearly with uh, global warming. So given that uh, we those impacts scale linearly with global warming, we can ex generalize, ex expand the relationship from, the, from this fact by considering that a given impact can be linked to the cumulative carbon emissions uh, when we decompose uh, their relationship with uh, uh, their linear scaling with global warming and considering the TCRE framework that we introduced earlier. And also we have to consider that uh, we, when looking at global warming, we have to consider non-CO2 contribution to global warming. So this is a formula we hope to propose. Um, so, but we have to consider that this approach is only valid for uh, climate impact that depends on temperature. So, in terms of research, uh, yeah, you, you need course. to wrap. You need to wrap up. We're 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 just about at three at three ten. So, sounds good. Okay, so uh, listing the gaps that we find in literature. Few studies looked at marine impacts, biological and society impacts but also co-occurrent co and cascading impacts. So co-occurrent and cascading impacts are, so co-occurrent impacts are, for example, when you have extreme rainfall and extreme uh, winds uh, occurring at the same time or same day, but then cascading impact when you have uh, an impact leading to another impact and on another impact. For instance, uh, heat wave leading to wildfire and uh, flooding in, in the same year. 
and those impacts are occurring now, but uh, it has been not part of the studies that we reviewed. So in summary, many impact, many physical impacts scale linearly with cumulative emission, despite high, the high level of complexity in the Earth system. Um, from the uh, from the peer-reviewed uh, publication, we, we reviewed uh, the observable impact of one trillion ton of car uh, cumulative carbon emission at the global and regional scale. Uh, result, the results are highly relevant for climate policy as they provide the opportunity to assess climate impact associated with every amount of carbon emissions, but there remain uh, little research on few impacts uh, or groups of impacts such as marine biological society impacts as well as co-occurring and cascading climate impacts. Thanks. Okay. Thanks very much, CM. Uh, we have a question um, from uh, Aurora Vic. Uh, thanks, uh, CM. We know TCRE uh, linearity works well as long as the CO2 um, is increasing and or stabilizing. Does all this, uh, um, uh, emissions by CO2 are increasing and or stabilizing, does all this work equally well for overshoot scenarios? Good question. Um, so uh, short answer is that we haven't explored that. Uh, but we believe that some impacts may hold, but uh, they might also be, it, this might not be the case for all impacts. So some other impacts uh, will have kind of display a lag or will have a verification, like a non linearity involved. Right. Yeah, that's a good answer because, uh, yeah, you have, um, you, you have a, uh, um, uh, you have the literature that's, and you can't do anything about the literature that's been published, but you also have the UVEC ESM to play with if, if to answer those kind of questions. All right, thanks. Well, we'll have it, we'll have some time for discussion. So I'd like to leave Mani's question for for uh, for later, if that's okay. So we can keep to time to uh, just in the next uh, fifteen minutes. So next, um, I'd like uh, uh, Alexander McIsaac to uh, to go ahead uh, with his presentation on the implications of earth system feedbacks from using reforestation to stabilize the climate in net zero pathways. Okay, Hi. I assume everyone can see uh, my slides. Uh, my name is Alex McIsaac. I'm a PhD candidate at Simon Fraser University. And like Paul said, I'm going to be talking about the implications of earth system feedbacks um, when using reforestation in net zero pathways. Uh, we frame this as uh, in terms of climate stability, but as we'll kind of go through in the next slides or so, I'm actually going to reframe this in terms of what we're kind of calling uh, climate neutrality. So let's take a look at what we've been up to. Um, so motivating this work has been a couple of uh, conclusions from the literature and kind of existing realities uh, that already are in play. Um, one of which is that research has recently shown that negative emissions are, are feasible with nature-based climate solutions. Um, this includes things like reforestation, regenerative agriculture, um, kelp farming, uh, and stuff like that. Um, and this is highly documented in the IPCC report that later came out. And indeed, some of these um, tools are already being used in carbon credit systems. Um, where you know, reforestation systems for or forest managed forests, for example, can sell carbon credits based off of the carbon they have sequestered. Um, so this got us thinking, okay, what uh, occurs, so sorry, will carbon offsets driven by reforestation lead to a climate neutral state? Um, so that's a state that um, would occur without needing the carbon uh, offsets in the first place. Um, and so it's can be imagined kind of in the conceptual diagrams I produced, um, where on the left we have an emissions path in Maroon that gets just about net zero sometime mid-century. Um, however, there might be the need for carbon offsets to kind of actually maintain that path. Um, and these carbon offsets will sequester carbon in kind of the shaded area. It's unclear based off of known biophysical, biogeochemical, and earth system feedbacks whether or not um, using the land surface to um, to sequester carbon will actually lead to a climate neutral state. So whether or not you'll get the um, temperature state that you're expecting from just the maroon line um, by using uh, reforestation and things for sequestering carbon. So you might be warmer or it might be cooler. Uh, so to look at this, uh, we ran a experiment design using the University of Victoria Earth Systems Climate Model. So the same climate model that Claude Michel was just talking about, 
It's a fully coupled Earth system model. Um, and first, we define our climate neutral baseline. Our climate neutral baseline um, is where fossil fuel emissions reach zero by 2050 after having declined linearly from their 2020 values, um, and then they're held zero from thereafter. And this, we allowed non CO2 radiative forcing also to decline quite steeply following a deep mitigation path, uh, SSP1 1.9 in our case. And also in the climate neutral baseline, uh, something that's quite key for our results, is that there was no new land use changes uh, from 2020 onwards. Um, so no new changes in agricultural area. Then we uh, established a reforestation baseline. In our case, this is going to be used to figure out the amount of carbon dioxide that our model will sequester on an ongoing basis. Um, so this is the same emissions and radiative forcing path um, as the climate neutral baseline with applied reforestation globally and also constrained to the tropics. And for reforestation, what we mean here is um, a return of agricultural space to the competitive algorithms uh, for plant functional types in our model. So from the reforestation baseline, uh, if we looked specifically at um, grid cells where reforestation occurred, we calculated the net land flux in those grid cells. And we've assumed that this net land flux is actually going to be our yearly, um, sequest whoopsie, sorry, our yearly sequestration rate. Um, and so following the design of certain carbon markets that already exist, we're able to say, okay, that yearly sequestration rate can then be emitted as fossil fuel emissions. Uh, in our case, we allowed those emissions to occur five years after the, uh, they occur in the net land flux. This results in a new emissions path um, for the global reforestation case. The offset emissions path looks something like in this green line where the shaded area is uh, sequestered carbon that we're expecting from uh, reforestation, which is shown in the map kind of, uh, the aerial coverage, which is shown in the map um, at the year 2100. So we have that, and that allows us to run our offset simulation to see how well this actually works at achieving climate stability. We also, like I said, did the same thing, but constrained it to the tropics um, where reforestation was only allowed to occur between the tropics of Capricorn and Cancer. And outside of the tropics, we again held land use change constant. So the agricultural areas were all kind of left equal at the 2020 level outside of the tropics in this simulation. There are a few kind of key differences between the tropics and global simulations, and I'll get into those a bit more as we go along. Okay, so looking at this from a perspective of carbon dioxide, um, we can look at it kind of two ways. The first way we're going to look at it is from the net land flux and reforested grid cells, where on the left I'm showing the reforestation baseline in the, uh, in the dash line. So that's the carbon sequestration we're expecting to get. And then in the solid line is the uh, sequestration in the offset simulation. So that's actually uh, what was achieved by the offset. And we can see that there is actually an amplification of carbon sequestration in our simulations in the global case here, uh, about 30 gigatons of carbon dioxide by the year 2100. And this in our model is due to the CO2 fertilization effect, which amplifies net primary productivity. And that's a result of the additional emissions that were being offset. It's kind of a, a bonus, if you will. From a global perspective, uh, atmospheric CO2 concentration is reduced in the offset simulation as compared to the climate neutral baseline, which recall is net zero without the need for reforestation. Um, and yeah, so this occurs basically, again, mostly as a result of the CO2 fertilization effect. However, when constrained to just the tropics, the results are a little bit different. The first thing to note is that the sequestration it is a cumulative amount is quite a bit higher uh, when reforestation is constrained to the tropics than it was in the global case. Uh, this has to do a little bit to the dynamics of succession in, in our model, um, but suffice it to say the same CO2 fertilization effect does occur. However, uh, in a global case, or sorry, looking at this from global atmospheric CO2 concentration perspective, um, the tropics do not become quite as carbon neutral as the global reforestation does. And this occurs mostly because of a feedback 
between changing the land surface uh, structure and uh, temperature, which actually um, increases soil respiration or so, sorry, prohibits soil respiration from decreasing in the tropical reforestation case as much as it would in the climate neutral case. And I'll show you a little bit more about what I mean here in the next slide. So if we look at climate neutrality, again, as from a uh, perspective of surface air temperature, we see that neither the global nor the tropic reforestation case reaches uh, the climate neutral baseline. So neither of them are exactly climate neutral. And this happens um, because as has been shown before in the literature, um, changing the land surface or adding more force to it decreases surface albedo. That's decreasing surface albedo, increases surface air temperature. Um, like I said, this actually has a bit of a feedback in the tropics case where soil respiration doesn't decline quite to the amount that we thought it would. Um, and so by the end of the century, um, climate neutrality is not quite achieved in either uh, simulation set and some work is still needed to be done. And that is mostly a biophysical effect in our simulation. So some key points, um, reforestation offsets can be enhanced by plant, they can enhance plant productivity under CO2 fertilization, um, which is to say that the additional emissions that get emitted actually have a, a benefit for plant growth in our model. Um, climate, however, climate neutrality is not completely achieved while using reforestation as a carbon offset, uh, mostly due to biophysical feedbacks in our simulations. And ultimately, stringent emissions remain the best option for reducing um, temperature, uh, global surface air temperature. And uh, yes, so one caveat though I should mention is that these simulations do not include um, Permanence questions, so there's no forest fires or anything that do occur um, that would also probably um, reduce the climate neutrality of uh, reforestation offsets. So that's my time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so are there uh, qu questions for Alexander? Feel free to unmute yourselves if you'd like. So the um, I, I was trying to understand as well that what's the, uh, the 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 reforestation scenario that you're talking about? What, what what's the actual scale? I, I'm trying to visualize it a, a bit because I, I didn't quite catch it. Did, would you care to, to speak about that? Like what sort of um, scale of of, of planting and 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 uh, and sort of letting letting these new forests grow is involved in in, in this? Um, yeah, so it's quite extensive in the global case. Um, it's over like a thousand uh, mega hectares um, ends up being reforested. Um, so essentially we just did this in a very simplistic format where we allowed all of what was agricultural area to regrow as forest if it could. Okay. okay. Um, and depending on which sort of latitudinal constraint we applied, um, you got more or less forest. In the global case, obviously we got the most. In the tropics case, so we got a little bit less. Right. So this, yeah, the intention. Right. You said you mentioned the separate tro tro tropical cases, and but it's the intention is really to bracket or, or uh, you know, what with the the largest. Yeah, we were trying to parse out a signal of um, applying carbon offsets in different sort of latitudinal bands. Yeah, um, we did this in the mid latitudes as well as in the high latitudes, um, yeah. and our results were a little bit less clear, and so we're still kind of working through um, not exactly why this happened, but whether or not they're valid. Right, and and is there enough knowledge at this point to say like when such when such a signal could be detected? Let's say you you know you you conceive of this kind of like uh, really really strong uh, uh, or, sorry pardon me really large scale planting program right um, and uh, with and you will look for verification and global verification. So what what would be the the I mean I guess you could look at CO two rates of change and so on, but uh, are, are, there, are there indicators that would tell you what kind of effect it was happening, you know, at the every decade or so uh, that, that you could, that maybe you can infer from the modeling you've done? Um, yeah, you could get changes in surface albedo. There'd have to be um, larger scale changes in order to really have a, a signal in surface air temperature at Not a global scale. Not yeah, but, but obviously, but like in CO2 or... In CO2, yeah, you could yeah. definitely get a more clear signal from that just from, yeah. from atmospheric CO2 measurements. 
Um, you could also, at a more local scale, and some people are doing works on this, um, take a look at the actual local benefits of doing things like reforestation. It's kind of known cooling of land surfaces in, in local areas from doing this. Um, so that, that's another kind of metric that you could look at. Are those radiative effects included in, in, in what you've done? I mean, are you, are you changing? Surface that? cooling, not uh, quite as clearly. Uh, the UVIX atmospheric component is quite um, simplistic. Right. <laughs> so That's there is thing. kind of a backbow transpiration, but it doesn't quite get the surface cooling that you would expect in the real world. Okay. Nor does it also get the latent heat release in the atmosphere that you would expect. <laughs> yes, yeah, there's a few things missing, but um, but it, it's it's great for exploring ideas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Well, thank, thank thanks you. a lot. Um, so uh, we could come back to some uh, further discussion. But what I'd like to do now is kind of go back to the very beginning of uh, this morning's session um, and uh, uh, have uh, Yen Ping Li um, present a, a bit of material that she didn't get a chance to because we had some technical issues. So Yen Ping, why, why don't you go ahead? Um, you can, yeah, I mean, let's not take up the, the whole time, but, you know, take, take a few minutes to sort of get to the key points of what you missed in the, in the first session. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So can you see my screen now or uh, let me yes. show it in the, in the slideshow mode? Brilliant. Please. Yes. There we okay, go. Good. It's moving now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, it was an easy fix. I, I, I couldn't do it in the morning yeah. somehow. Anyway, yeah, so um, yeah, I would like to just uh, maybe take this opportunity to complete the, the part that was interrupted in the morning. And uh, I, I, I gave a brief introduction about the dynamic downscaling work we have been doing and the simulation we conducted for, like, uh, conducted by my group for Western Canada and jointly with NCA for the uh, CONUS 1 project, which is completed already, and the ongoing CONUS 2 project, which has a much larger domain. Um, okay, um, and okay, so um, this is the, like the simulation we have completed, and based on this uh, continental scale uh, coupled regional climate simulation, we, we further developed uh, um, New module into the into the, the the modeling system to set to make it be able to use for our own interest like uh, the prairie we have a we have a two major type landscape that is the the agricultural land and the, the wetland uh, so we developed a new module in the in the in the land surface model that is different uh, different uh, crop types. Uh, um, and uh, uh, yesterday he, he introduced the development of a sweet spring wheat. wheat. Um, and the, with that, we'll be able to study the, the climate change impact on agriculture and also how the like adaptive cropping strategies should be taken uh, to take advantage of climate change and uh, the future cropping choices, uh, such as if corn can be grown in the prairie in the future under warmer climates. And on the other hand, we have also been doing another parallel project that is the development of the wetland module in the, in the model, uh, because the prairie portal wetland is a significant feature uh, here in the prairie. And for that, we have introduced a new groundwater scheme and a new definition of wetland in the model, because the model is like, like grid point four by four, and there's a lot of wetland, they are much smaller, like, like smaller than uh, than four kilometers, they are like uh, hundred meters. Uh, so, and how can we uh, sim simulate in the drainage process? This is a human acti uh, human activity. So, we, how can we simulate that in the model? Um, and um, I think I stopped here. This is kind of like our motivation. Why we want to do uh, such thing? Like because you, if you ever fly across Saskatchewan and you look from your, your airplane window, you see picture like this, like the, the surface is kind of like agricultural crop, agricultural land mixed with a small pond. So this is the port, uh, prairie pothole wetland. And uh, these two ecosystems, they are well mixed uh, over the prairies. And that's, that's why our study, like well, our modeling strategy split it to like the development of the uh, agriculture part to understand the impact of, of climate change on like on the agriculture, on, on crop, and also the 
the impact of climate change on wetland. And then these two, uh, two de model development is going to join by the end to help us to study how the, uh, what's that, the climate change impact on the prairie and how human activity induced the land, land surface, land type change will feed back to regional climate um, using our coupled uh, land atmosphere modeling system. Um, so like um, we know that climate variability has a significant impact on the crop production. Um, so I, I, uh, I put a figure here on the top right or top left. That is an example uh, showing the annual average of corn yield in the US since 1960. So you can see that there's a, a in general upward trend with some like uh, some significant decrease in several years and the highlight with drought. So that means um, um, extreme events, extreme weather and climate event can cause dramatic reduction in, in, some, in some particular years. And uh, such trend, like I, I didn't, I mean, there's no, you can imagine the future trend. So without any further technological imp imp improvement, I mean, like, uh, like the gene, uh, gene DNA project or whatever, uh, <laughs> such trend can no longer continue because um, the temperature will rise above its optimal level. And, uh, and uh, the other way to improve or to secure the crop production will be like to make sure such dramatic re reduction in several years will not, not, not happen through some kind of like uh, irrigation or other, um, I mean, mainly irrigation, I guess. Um, so, um, if when we talked about irrigation, we introduced another another concept that is the water productivity in cropland, um, which is uh, which is uh, somehow the figure I show in the lower in the lower right. That is the crop production against the water use. Uh, water use can be water like rain plus irrigation. Um, so the, 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 the figure here is actually our, our recent study, and we use corn as example. Um, so you can see that in general, the corn production increases with more available water supply, but, but somehow it's going to reach a plateau at some level, which means it's no longer increase uh, with the same trend as it was. Um, so that means there is an optimal water use of condition on crop production and the water exceeding this threshold become much less efficient. Okay, and um, so in the future, the increased, uh, the, 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 the yield, the yield of crop production will have a, a more uncertainty um, because the temperature increase and the re rainfall becomes more unpredictable, uh, more variable. Uh, during the growing season. Um, so what we have been doing uh, right now, like in introducing the new crop types into the land surface model and coupled it with high resolution convection permitting model, um, we hope that by doing so, we'll be able to answer some uh, really meaningful scientific questions, like how can we can we model modeling climate change impact on crop growth and food production, like focusing on temperature increase, um, we, which lengthens the growing season, and also modeling the climate change impact on, on crop growth, uh, uh, modeling, <laughs> modeling the climate change impact on water availability and uh, and how the possible measures to encounter such such threats, like through 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 um, re reducing the drought effect and the human management, also crop growth dynamics and their feedback to the atmosphere and hydrological cycle, um, because crops crops are like interface between water on the ground and above the ground, and. Uh, Ultimately, we want to use this uh, like earth system modeling to answer a big scientific question. That is, how can we adapt the agricultural agricultural production system to the climate change? Okay, this is our agriculture study. So, uh, so the other uh, the other project uh, that's ongoing at the same time is the 
study of the wetland. And the, like we know prairie porthole wetland provides uh, many important eco, eco, ecosystem services like attenuating flooding, uh, storing carbon, and supporting the global important waterfowl population. So we mainly focus on the heat generous effect of climate change on different parts of the prairie wetland. Um, so specifically what we, what we have been doing is obtain the hydrological condition from two coupled wolf simulation, the historical one and the future one. We then use them to estimate future wetland extent in the prairie. Uh, first, we introduced a subgrade fraction F1 to indicate the special extent of wetlands because a lot of wetland, they have a, a size smaller than four kilometer by four kilometer. Um, and we then used a statistical model, um, generalized uh, addictive model, GM, and uh, to predict a fractional index F1 for each four grade points. And these two, the two import, inputs for this model are the soil water, soil water content, SWC, and a factor predictor, ecoregion. This model was then calibrated and evaluated against the two static wetland layers in the prairie. So this work is what we, what we conducted together with the Ducks, Ducks Unlimited Canada. Um, so uh, Yanping, we're, we're kind of running out of time in this session, so. Okay, do yeah, I'm, I'm done. Up? This okay. is uh, uh, the yeah. last slide. Okay. So, yeah, so I mean, uh, like, after we have done the, the first step, the second step is we combined the impact of future climate change condition with the historical drainage situation and overlay the drainage score with score layers with the climate change impact on the extreme dry and wet cases. And uh, we identified the two regions highlighted here. The, they suggest very diversified conservation strategies. So the West Canada prairie will experience wetter conditions that suggests the wetland retention and restoration. While on the east, the fluctuation hydrological condition overlaps with high drainage score, suggesting that the wetland conservation is in urgent need. So this is my <laughs> the end of the, my talk. Uh, yeah, just give you some idea about what we have been doing using uh, this uh, coupled uh, model system, model modeling system, and how can we use to solve some real problems. Great. Okay. Well, th th thanks very much, Yanping. And, and just in the interest of kind of going back over the session, um, there, there was an outstanding question from, um, from Manny uh, for CM, and it was about the uh, time dependence of CO2 um, in, in the model. So you, you probably read the question. So do you, you please go ahead and, uh, and uh, answer Manny's question. Yeah. Okay, so if the question is asking about the result that I showed. Um, so yes, uh, the simulations were, were for a historical simulation, including all four things, and CO2 was prescribed uh, from like historical emissions. So it's steady increase from the historical period and prescribed as emissions, not CO2 in concentration. Okay, thanks. Um, she, uh, Manny meant historically in the recent years, does it fit a specific form? Um, not in the case of emissions that I, the result that I showed. Mm -hmm. So I understand, for example, if for prescribed CO2, they may use like 1% increase per year. So, but in the case of my results, they were prescribed anthropogenic emissions. So like uh, from a historical period, which I think can still relate to 1% increase in CO2, but I prescribed emissions from that were obtained from data set, like CMIP6 data sets. Okay, thanks. Well, it, um, as often happens, um, <laughs> we, we uh, have some, uh, oh, some, some money, uh, I was, uh, was satisfied with that answer. Um, yeah, as often happens, we kind of run out of time uh, just as we start the discussion. Um, but I, so I'd just like to thank the speakers from the last, uh, from, from, from the three sessions uh, that we've had here. I, 
I, I it, we have a lot going on in Canada in our system modeling. And one of the purposes of holding the session was just to expose everybody to the range of activities that are going on. Um, and uh, we've, I, I hope that uh, you enjoyed the session. Please let me know and our, uh, the other conveners uh, like, uh, like Yan Ping and, and Neil Swart. Uh, just keep in touch and see, uh, let us know what you think of holding this kind of general session on our system modeling in, uh, in future uh, CMOS Congresses. Uh, but for now, I think I'll keep to time and, uh, and sign off. And uh, that means in 10 minutes, there'll be, there'll be a 10 minute break and then the uh, tectonic session will, will uh, convene at that, uh, at, uh, the uh, 10 minutes to the hour. All right, so uh, thanks everyone and take care. Okay, it's time to start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today for the uh, Tectonics and Dynamics of the Earth Interior session. Uh, we have a wide range of talks today, from mental convection to plate reconstruction, um, lithospheric drips and delamination, crustal and lithospheric deformations, and so on. Uh, my name is Arkan Gun, and I will be convening this session together with Claire Curry and Rasmus our first speaker is Michael King, and his talk will be on plate reconstruction of the Southern North Atlantic Ocean. Um, Michael, please go ahead and um, share your screen. Us. Great, sounds good. Can you see my slides and hear me? Okay. So it's all good. Yes, it looks good. Okay, thank you very much for the confirmation. All right, hello everyone. As just mentioned, my name is Michael King. I'm currently a PhD candidate at Memorial University of Newfoundland under the supervision of Dr. Kim Wilford. And today I'm going to be introducing you to some of my recent PhD work, uh, which is focused on reconstructing the Southern North Atlantic Ocean back to time using the foam plate tectonic models. So the main tectonic regime of interest are rift margins. And if we think about the way that we classify rift margins based on their morphology, uh, we can usually subdivide them between being either magma poor or magma rich. In terms of the rift margins of the Southern North Atlantic that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, they're generally magma poor. So if we have a look at the map here on the left-hand side. Uh, so some of the, one of the margins I'm going to be talking about quite a bit today is the Newfoundland margin shown on the western side of the Atlantic right here. Uh, if we go across the Atlantic Ridge and onto the European side of things, we're also going to be talking about the Irish margin. And as well, if we go to the south, we're we'll also be looking at the West Siberian margin today too. Um, so if you think about the general evolution of a rift margin in terms of the schematic that I have here on the right hand side. And if we start with panel A, so typically we start with a phase of stretching and then basically this leads to thinning of the crust as shown in panel B here. And basically usually we thin the crust enough that it leads to hypertension and sometimes exhumation. And you can think of panel D right here as almost like a final rift template. Um, so as you can see, there's all kinds of interesting features and structures and basins uh, within this final template. And one of the things I'm going to be talking about in particular today are these continental blocks outlined in this uh, red rectangle right here. So what are these continental blocks? Uh, so basically these are blocks of continental crust range of thickness about 20 to 30 kilometers thick. And they're usually bordered by sedimentary basins that have undergone various amounts of crustal thinning. So on the map on the left-hand side here, we can see some of the examples of continental blocks throughout the Atlantic Ocean based on the work of those for me and also my own work. Uh, so for example, if you look at the Newfoundland margin, we can see that the Flemish cap is an example of a continental block right here that I'll be talking about quite a bit today. And if we go out across on the Irish margin, for example, we also have the porcupine bank shown right here. And one of the things you might be wondering, well, you know, where do these polygons come from? How do we actually map the crustal architecture of these blocks? And arguably one of the best things to use when we're trying to map these blocks is using crustal thickness estimates computed by a 3D gravity inversion. Um, so that's basically shown on the left-hand side here for the rift and margins of interest. 
Uh, so just to note the color bar here, so in the blues where our, our, our represented areas of relatively thinner crust, and then the greens represent areas of relatively thicker crust. Uh, so for example, if you look at the new flame margin shown on the western side of the Atlantic here, we can see that the Flemish cap kind of stands up fairly well as a continental block right here, ranges in thickness from about 20 to 30 or 25 to 30 kilometers thick. And one of the things I also want to emphasize is that we can also use other data sets to define the geometry of these blocks too, such as seismic refraction profiles. So if we look at the seismic refraction profile A to A prime across the Orphan Basin right here, and if we have a look at that profile at the top right hand side of my screen, you see there's all kinds of interesting uh, features along this profile. So we have the failed rift within the West Orphan Basin, uh, we have the various coastal highs throughout the Central Orphan Basin, and of course we also have the uh, Flemish cap, which is largely what I'm interested in right here, and we can also see its uh, relative geometry and thickness uh, in 2D. And of course, these continental blocks are also bordered by sedimentary basins. So some sedimentary basins I'm going to be talking about today. So and today I'm going to be talking about the Orf Basin here on the New Flamer quite a bit. So it's located north of the oil producing uh, John Dark John Dark Basin shown right here. Um, so in terms of the objectives of my study, you know, one thing that we're trying to do is investigate the kinematics and coastal evolution of these continental blocks. Uh, but on top of that, we're also trying to investigate their kinematic uh, impact on the evolution of the sedimentary basins surrounding them. So trying to understand how the kinematics of these blocks uh, impact the deformation experience within these basins. And in addition to that, another objective of the study is that we're also trying to um, or investigate the role of inheritance. Um, so one of the interesting things about the Atlantic Ocean is that rifting initiated within a Paleozoic belt. Um, so if you have a look at the map on the left-hand side here, so this is a map of all the ancient orogenic terrains throughout the Atlantic. And you can see that they vary quite a bit along stricular margins. So for example, we can see that along the Newfoundland margin here, we can see a lot of different terrains and boundaries separating these orogenic terrains. Um, so one of the questions that we're also asking ourselves is potentially what role do these terrains and terrain boundaries play uh, during the stages of rifting and potentially how do they interplay with the kinematics of continental blocks and the deformation uh, going on during the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so to try and answer all these questions, we're gonna be using deformal plate tectonic models. Um, so these are built using the interplay of the G-Plate software and its Python programming library, PyG-Plates. Uh, so G-Plates and PyG-Plates are developed by the Earthquake Group at the University of Sydney, Australia. And G-Plates has a lot of interesting capabilities and arguably one of the ones that's uh, are most uh, well known is the ability to uh, build and visualize uh, rigid plate models and also the formal plate tectonic models. Uh, so an example of a rigid plate model is shown on the bottom of my slide right here. Uh, so basically this is a reconstruction of the Atlantic back to 83 million years ago with some topography data laid over it. And to explain these, or to explain these formal plate tectonic models in a bit more detail, I'm going to refer your attention to the figure on the right hand side here. Um, so as with all models, we need to start with all inputs when we're building these formal plate tectonic reconstructions. Um, so first things first is that we need to define boundaries in which deformation is going to take place in these models. Uh, so if we look at panel one right here, so we need to define first an exterior boundary, so such as this blue line right here. This can represent something such as a continental ocean boundary or the edge of continental crust. And then we also need to define interior boundaries such as this red boundary right here, which can represent in terms of rift emergence such as the Viking lines, so basically where significant rift related deformations are related, uh, to initiate. And then basically within these model boundaries, we kind of have any kind of independent features that can move within these boundaries that we like, such as continental blocks I'm interested in, uh, such as this green polygon right here, and also these uh, purple dots on the right hand side here. Um, so basically, then once we have these model in inputs, we can construct what's referred to in G plates as a topological network here, shown on the right hand side. Um, so basically, what this does is that it creates a triangulation mesh as shown right here. And this triangulation mesh is really important because it allows us to measure how strain rate evolves within the model throughout geological time. So this is basically subjected to the plates that are moving around the boundaries and also the independent continental blocks that are able to move uh, within the mesh. So then this is really advantageous because then basically once we have a way of measuring how strain rate evolves within these models, uh, we can actually input a present day coastal thickness model as shown in panel three here, and we can actually reconstruct this model back through time. Um, so in terms of the workflow based on uh, my work is that this could be really advantageous for rifted margins because we can reconstruct things such as pre rift coastal thickness templates, and we can also assess the deformation within the continental blocks I'm interested in and also how they impact uh, the sedimentary basins for geological time. So just to be as clear as possible, basically, of what we're doing here. Um, so if I can draw your attention to here at the top of my slide. Uh, so basically, this represents coastal thicknesses or coastal thickness estimates along the new flat margin. We also have a deformal plate model here. Uh, so in the black represents kind of the exterior boundary, and the blue represents the interior boundary. And on the interior, we have our triangulation mesh. And one of the things I want to emphasize too is that we don't just have to reconstruct coastal thicknesses. We actually 
we can show other data sets if you wish as well. Uh, so for example, on the right-hand side here, we have the same deformable plate model, except that we have magnetic anomalies offshore Newfoundland. Then basically when we take these data sets and we reconstruct them back through time, say for example, if we wanted to reconstruct them back to 200 million years ago, uh, this is a result that we get on the bottom of the slide. So for example, in panel A1 here on the bottom left, we reconstruct the crustal thicknesses back to 200 million years ago. So potentially getting an idea of what the potential uh, pre-drastic uh, crustal thickness template of the new flame margin looked like when you see all kinds of interesting segmentation and variabilities. And we can also kind of compare these crustal thickness trends to what we're seeing in the reconstructed magnetic anomalies as well. And there's some interesting uh, trends here that I'm going to be talking about in the coming slides, potentially what these mean. So now that we have a little bit of a better idea in terms of what these deformal plate models are, how they're built, and you know what can we quantitatively extract from them, uh, I'm going to show you how I applied this. So for the sake of time today, I'm going to be introducing you to one model. Uh, throughout the course of my PhD, I've tested hundreds of models. Today, I'm going to be focusing on one. Um, so the model I'm going to be showing you is shown on the right-hand side here. Um, so basically, the crustal thickness estimates that we're going to be reconstructing this model are the estimates uh, computed along the Newfoundland margin, uh, Labrador margin. Uh, the Irish margin, also the West Siberian margin down here to the south. Uh, we're going to be including some continental blocks with independent kinematics in this model. So in particular, the Flemish Cap and Southern Grand Bank scale on the Newfoundland margin, and also the Porcupine Bank shown right here, and the Rockall Hatton Bank uh, along the Irish margin. And in terms of pulse rotation, so we're using pulse rotation from a previous study from p 2019, and also combined with my own pulse rotation uh, from this study as well. Then basically, once we take this present day model and reconstruct it back through time, back to 200 million years ago, uh, this is the result that we get on the right-hand side here. So basically represents the potential pre-Jurassic crustal thickness template of the Atlantic. Uh, so just to note the color bar again, so in the blues, are areas relatively thin across, and in the greens, are areas relatively thick across. And there's quite a bit going on here. So one of the things I'm going to focus on for the rest of this talk is just kind of focusing on the new flame margin. So kind of this area that I'm kind of outlining with my laser pointer right here. Um, so one of the things that's probably fairly obvious is that there's highly variable crustal thicknesses at the pre-Jurassic plate of the Atlantic. And in particular, if we focus on the new flame margin, so if we look at the Orphan Basin, which is basically this area I'm highlighting right here, uh, we can see that there's a lot of variability. So for example, in the West Orphan Basin, we can kind of see this Northeast Southwest trending area of kind of relatively lower crust right here. And one interesting thing that we, we can also see is the pre-Jurassic nature of the continental blocks themselves. For example, we can see that the crustal thicknesses in the Flemish cap here, for example, are quite variable. And we can see relatively uh, thinner areas across kind of in vicinity of the Flemish Pass Basin. And we can also see some interesting variations as we go into the Grand Banks and to the Southern Grand Banks tail, which is this area right down here. Um, so now that I kind of described these pre-Jurassic fossil thickness results, um, I'm going to start talking about them in terms of some more discussion points in terms of, you know, what can we get out of these models and, you know, potentially what do they mean moving forward? Um, so one of the things that I wanted to focus on first was the pre-Jurassic nature of the continental land side here. Um, so one of the things that we've been able to distinguish with these continental blocks based on these recent results is kind of dividing them between what I'm referring to as primary blocks and secondary blocks. Uh, so an example of a primary block is the Flemish gap here shown by the yellow dots. And these blocks really do have a really big impact on the deformation that is experienced within the sounding or surrounding sedimentary basins. Um, but they also really have a big impact with respect to the evolution of these smaller secondary blocks as well. So these secondary blocks actually form organically to the model. So they're not actually included as model inputs. Um, so for example, the Galicia Bank kind of shown here, this relatively area, their thick area of cross is representative of a secondary block. And we also have the Orphan Knoll, which is this kind of green star area right here that I have in the center of the Orphan Basin. So these secondary blocks are largely forming due to the kinematics of these smaller continental blocks and larger plates that are around them. And one of the things that I also kind of alluded to at the beginning of my talk, so one of the things that we also want to discuss here is the potential role of inheritance for these results. Um, so one of the things that you're seeing here on the right-hand side, so you're seeing the pre dress coastal thickness model of the Atlantic, but we're also overlaying the onshore to offshore extension of ancient morphogenic boundaries. So if we focus on the new or on the orphan basin shown right here, and we look at the west orphan basin in particular, we can see that this area of relatively kind of lower and weaker coastal thickness trend actually corresponds quite well to we have the offshore extension of the this blue fault right here referred to as the Dover fault, and also this red fault right here referred to as the Beckman line. So it's potentially saying that these. Could you wrap up? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I'll wrap up right now. Um, so it's potentially saying that these orogenic boundaries really do play a key role in terms of the pre-Jurassic plate of the Atlantic here. Uh, so in conclusion, these deformal plate models have served as a useful tool for studying across the new evolution of the Atlantic. Uh, we've been able to recognize kind of two themes in my thesis in terms of the kinematics of primary blocks versus secondary blocks. 
and also trying to assess the impact of our, 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 our orogenic inheritance. So some pretty strong correlations between these offshore orogenic boundaries and also where we're seeing segmentation and variabilities within the Jurassic fossil plates. Um, so that's everything I have to say. So thank you very much for listening. I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody might have. So thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Um, any questions? We have a one minute or two. Clement, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good talk. Uh, I, I, if you can put your last slide here. Uh, this one here. The one before, uh, wait, there's a lot of time. Yeah, okay, here. Yeah. So for your crystal thickness mole, I, I see that you have lots of like very detailed feature in your mole. I was wondering like, do you know like how robust those features are or do you have an idea of the uncertainty? Like can you quantify uncertainty in your mole? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so in terms of quantifying uncertainty, it's something that we haven't been able to actually quantify with these models, but basically we have done a kind of a robust test on the model inputs to seeing what impact they have. Um, so I didn't have time to talk about those today, but we did do a lot of tests in terms of like, you know, what happens if we don't include these blocks in our models, or what happens if we change the boundaries of the of the mesh and so on. And um, basically what happens is that, so for example, if we were to not include any of these blocks, the blocks themselves actually still show up, but they basically don't reconstruct the base. So that's kind of the way that we address some of the, I guess, the impact of the model inputs and the uncertainties. But the uncertainty is a good question because uh, these models are built on a lot of different geophysical data sets, which have uncertainties themselves. So definitely something to, uh, I guess, consider when we're evaluating these results. So it's a great point. Um, thanks, Mike. Unfortunately, we don't have any time for the, another question. Um, we're gonna um, continue with um, Clement Estelle and um, his talk will be on a seismic deformation at the uh, Beaufort Sea Continental Margin. Can you see my, my slides? And can you hear me yes, well? Yes, yes, everything's perfect. Okay, so thank you. Um, thanks for the convener to having me today to present my research, which is entitled Seismic Evidence for a Weakened Big Crust Beneath the but for C continental margin, um, I would like to acknowledge my, my co-workers first, Yajin Liu, uh, Ivan Kulakov, Andrew Schaefer, and Pascal O'Day. And so before starting, here is a map of uh, Western Canada um, and also Eastern Canada, Eastern Alaska, showing the, the main tectonic features in the area. And played on top of that is the seismicity from 2015 to 2022 and magnitude uh, earthquakes are scaled by magnitude. And as you can see, earthquake seismicity is mainly distributed along the plate boundaries here in the Cassidy subduction zone, the Yakutat collision zone. This is seismicity related to the Pacific slab, but also we know like seismicity occurs a uh, thousand kilometers away from the, the, the closest plate boundary, for example, in the, in the Mackenzie Mountains and, and further north in northern Yukon and uh, northeastern Alaska. And so uh, during this talk, I'll, I'll be uh, diving into uh, basically this area here, uh, which encompasses uh, Northeastern Alaska and, and Northern uh, Yukon. And so I think it's always good to have a, an idea of uh, the geological history and, uh, and tectonic history of the region. So to the left, you have a map from Lane in 2002, showing the different episodes of deformation from uh, Lake Cretaceous to um, Cenozoic. And as you can see, as we go north, the um, uh, episodes of deformation young, uh, they, they get younger and younger. Um, we have a number of different tectonic structures in the regions of thrust fronts, anticlines, inclines, uh, some normal folds here. But what is really interesting to note is this uh, uh, fold and thrust belt that is located on the continental shelf up in the north within the, the Beaufort Sea. So this uh, fold and thrust belt is thought to have formed during um, Paleocene to um, Cenozoic with uh, locally some ints for like a Holocene deformation. And it was formed due to the interplay of three different geological events uh, due to first the uh, opening of the North Atlantic Ocean. There is, uh, you have like uh, geological markers for east-west shortening associated to uh, the Atlantic the opening of the Atlantic Ocean. You had also several episodes of deformations to the south with the subduction of the Kula Plate, uh, subduction of the Pacific Plate, and uh, lastly, the uh, Yakutat collision zone. 
Um, and the last point here is the northward escape of uh, superficial rocks, uh, northward toward the Beaufort Sea margin due to the buttressing of uh, the, the rigid um, North American Craton to the east and Arctic Alaska to the west. So when, when we look in cross sections, in cross section view now, so southwest is here, northeast is here, you can see here, we have a number of thrust fronts that are connected to this hypothetical basalt attachment. So that's an interpretation from a seismic reflection profile. And um, that's basically what we see in subduction zones, basically. Um, here you have two maps. The, the one on the left shows the main um, style deformation in, in the area and with the focal mechanism solutions. And to the right, you have the uh, data set that we considered in on the analysis. Each dot represents earthquakes uh, scaled by their magnitude from one to six, and they are color coded by uh, their depths. Note that earthquakes within the Beaufort Sea extend deeper than uh, 20 kilometers depth. And so basically seismicity is focused in uh, three regions. The first one is uh, the Richardson Mountains. Uh, this region hosted like um, Earthquakes were greater, maybe greater than six, I think 6.5 in the 6.4 in the 60s. Um, and um, focal mechanisms tend to suggest that we have a right lateral uh, strike slip motion here with a bit of normal motion to the north. Uh, when we travel west in northeastern um, Alaska, here we are in a region called the Canning River displacement zone. That's a zone of diffuse seismicity. And uh, this region hosted the uh, uh, 2018 uh, Kaktovik earthquake sequence with the uh, uh, largest ever recorded earthquake in northeastern Alaska, 6.4 during uh, this earthquake sequence. And here, the, the, the tectonic the style of deformation is basically left lateral uh, strike slip motion. And further north within the Beaufort Sea, we have this cloud of seismicity. Uh, whose uh, origin remains poorly constrained is the lack of seismic stations uh, in, the, in the surrounding area. Um, this is for the, some people spe speculated that the origin of the seismicity is due to uh, basically the tectonic loading uh, from the Mackenzie Delta with the sediment influx here. So basically having some uh, uh, lithosphere flexure here. Uh, and other people suggested that this could be reflect the under thrusting of the oceanic lithosphere beneath uh, North America. I would like also to point out this region here in Northern Yukon where there is a clear absence of seismicity here. Uh, note that the, the two uh, inward facing arrows shows the uh, FH max here. Um, lastly, the, 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 the last thing that I want to highlight from these maps is this red arrow here, which is showing the slow convergence. So this uh, block here, the, this north, northern Yukon block here is moving northward toward the Beaufort Sea at the rate of a few millimeters per year. That's constrained from um, GPS modeling. Uh, you have on the left a model from Stefan Mazzotti in 2008 and to the right a model from Lucinda Leonard in 2007. Both models suggest that we have this northward escape of uh, this crystal block here towards the Beaufort Sea. Um, and as you can see from Leonardo et al, there is the uh, scale of the, the, the arrows here shows the amplitude of the motion and it reduces as we go, it decreases as we go north. And because there were no uh, GPS station, there's still no GPS stations up there. So there is a big question mark. Is it accommodated at the fold and thrust belt here? And some people suggested that um, this may represent a really rare case of incipient subduction zone in the area. But however, we don't have a lot of uh, knowledge on the, the fault structure of uh, the uh, relation with the uh, tectonic events with the earthquakes. And, and so, and that's basic, basically because of uh, the sparsity of uh, geophysical stations in, in the area. But recently we had the um, deployment of the uh, US RHA stations across uh, the Alaska and across Western Canada and Northwestern Canada. So you have two maps before the deployment of the USRA GA stations and after, and you can see that it, it, it filled <laughs> quite a lot of gaps. So now we are able to um, develop um, a new tomographic model of this region with this data set. And we are going to investigate this question to whether the Beaufort Sea margin is a newly forming converted margin, potentially representing a rare case of incident subduction. 
So in order to answer this question, we uh, developed a new regional P and S wave tomography using the uh, regularized isotropic least square inversion method of Ivan Kolekhov in 2009. This method is simultaneously in BERT for absolute P and S wave velocities and also source coordinates. So the data set consists of two self-similar P and S wave uh, arrival time data sets, about 13,000 P and S wave arrival times that are plotted here. So on the y-axis, you have the P wave or S wave arrival time, and the x-axis, the distance in kilometer between the source and the, the, the receiver. Uh, and as I said, for the stations, we included uh, all the available seismic stations in the region, so mostly uh, US or stations. But uh, we had some um, Canadian um, owned uh, seismic station like uh, Inuvik, for example. And so we have a, a good rate density for, from the surface to 60 to 70 kilometer depth uh, onshore, not offshore. Uh, I, I won't go through the details of the modeling on that stuff because I don't have the time today. But if you have questions on how we get to the final model, please feel free to ask at the end of the presentation. Uh, here I present the final model. So the top row shows. Uh, the VP mole, the VS mole, and the VP VS ratio mole at 20 kilometers depths. Uh, VP and VS are plotted as perturbations related to uh, regional average background velocity. And the VP VS extends from 1.6 to 1.9 at 20 kilometers depths. Uh, the, the middle and bottom row show the, um, lo the transect. So, location of transect are shown here. A, a prime is uh, perpendicular to the margin and BB prime is margin parallel here. And they all go through this uh, low, extremely low velocity anomaly within the crust. So as you can see on AA prime uh, for VP and VS, there's a very low velocity anomaly. And the dashed line here represents the moho depths that we got from a surface wave model in the region. And you see that the low velocity anomaly tends to go slightly beneath the, the estimated moho here. So this would suggest that locally, we may have some uh, crystal thickening. And this region corresponds to uh, basically beneath the uh, remains of Atlas and, and, and the high elevation that we see here. Uh, if we look at the VPVS, we see that there is uh, no strong correlation. There is no like a strong uh, VPVS associated to this uh, low velocity anomalies. Uh, VPVS uh, ratio goes ranges from like 1.7 to 1.78, where we have this low velocity anomaly. Um, same thing for the BB prime. On the BB prime transect, we see that it dips towards the Northwest. So now the question is whether this is a robust feature in our mole. So we did some synthetic uh, modeling. So to the left, you have um, the synthetic test where we put a very low velocity anomaly, about 10%, and another a low velocity anomaly around it, about 4%. So that's supposed to mimic the real structure that we observed in, in our real mole, in the real data mole. And the middle uh, column here shows the output mole, and you can see that uh, it, it's actually very well retrieved. So that tells us that this is a, a really robust feature in our mole. And to the right, you have the path coverage uh, along the transect within uh, plus or minus 20 kilometers around the transect. So now the question is whether this is temperature composition. Um, so here we tr try to look at whether it's temperature or, or not. And so we plotted heat flow measurement. Why do we do that? Because um, we, the, the, the seismic velocities would be, for example, very influenced by um, partial melting in the lower crust. And that would be seen in heat flow measurement. So if there were a partial melting in the lower crust, you would expect very high heat flow measurements at the surface. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of uh, measurements around the, the low velocity anomaly that we have from our um, P uh, wave mole, S wave mole, we have some um, a handful of uh, measurements on the edge of the low velocity anomaly, but they tend to suggest um, not more than, uh, not greater than 70 milliwatt per square meter. Here's another model from Grass Vietal 2012, and same thing, they suggest that this area doesn't show any very high heat flow measurements in the region. So this basically rules out partial melting and high crystal temperatures as the origin of the low seismic velocity anomaly. So now we look at composition. So now this is the P wave mode from 5.4 to 8.2 kilometers per second. Um, that's, this is the absolute VP at 20 kilometers depths. I outlined in red the low velocity anomaly. And now you can see it extends from 6.1 to 6.6 .6 kilometers per second. Yeah. 
And when you compare with lab experiments from McChristensen and Mooney, uh, you have the T wave velocity here, and you have a number of mythologies, and you see that at 20 kilometer equivalent depths, we are in the range of a diorite, a granite, gneiss, so Celsic rocks, basically. Could you wrap up, please? Yeah. Um, east and west, we have a higher velocity, about 6.67 kilometers per second, that corresponds to more mafic uh, bulk composition. When we take the ratio of the two, S wave and P wave, we'll, we'll see that this is, again, in agreement with that. So as I said earlier, there were no seismicity in this region where we had the low velocity anomaly. So this lack of seismicity despite active deformation suggests a weak rheology due to either plastic deformation mechanism in weak rocks or that strain rate is too low for seismic deformation. So a seismic deformation is a result of lateral variations in composition and rheology. So in conclusion, we did a, a new P and S wave velocity mode of the both C continental margin. But the issue that we had is that we don't have enough paths to retrieve the seismic velocity structure offshore. So we just have like half the picture here. So the two conclusion was that deformation is controlled by lateral variation in crystal strength attributed to different crystal compositions in the region. In red is the low velocity anomaly and where we expect a Celsic bulk composition. Uh, and we see that we had also a crystal thickening occurring locally beneath the both a continental margin, that's this little area shown here. And whether the, for the question about subduction initiation, uh, we need uh, additional data provided by uh, ocean bottom seismometers deployed, well, well, deployed on the continental shelf, but also for the north in the both a sea. Another thing to try was to, would be to install GPS station on top of this low velocity anomaly to see if this region is uplifting or not and see where the formation is mainly focused. And that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. Um, thanks, Lamont. It was a great talk, but unfortunately, we don't have time left for the questions. But if you have questions, please uh, use the chat box uh, or directly or uh, to everyone. Um, to, you can write your questions. I think Lamont will be answering these questions in the chat box. So we have to move on with our last presenter of this, the first part of the uh, session, because after the, um, the this uh, uh, last talk, we will have a 20 minutes a break, and after that, we're going to move on with the second part of the session. So our last presenter of this part is uh, Tai Cha, and um, the talk will be about lithospheric delamination. Uh, tai Cha, could, you can share your screen with us. Yeah. So yeah. So right now you can see my screen. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Hi, I need to change the topic. Today, I will present a couple of the geodynamic models to examine the surface expressions of lithospheric delamination. And I'm working on this project with Claire. Uh, since the mantle lithosphere is cooler than the sublithospheric mantle, and the mantle lithosphere tend to cause the gravitational instabilities. After the continental thickening, the uh, thick lithosphere is possible to form the acrogite high slower crust, and uh, the presence of the acrogite will assist to remove the lithosphere. In general, this um, removal event uh, will have the two types. One we call it one is the dripping lithosphere, and uh, the second type is the delamitating lithosphere. And there are two end members uh, for the lithosphere removal models we can test. So here I focus on the delamating lithosphere. The goal of this study is to um, investigate the surface effects caused by the delamation. And the delamation can peel the entire mental lithosphere away from the crust. This removal event uh, leads to the variation in the surface elevations. In this cartoon, we can see the surface uplift migrations corresponds to the rightward delamations. Additionally, this um, surface extension and mantle melting are located in the lithosphere thinning regions. And this surface responses caused by delamination may explain uh, some mysterious observation in the intraplate setting, including like in, in uh, the increasing, increasing volcanic activity, surface uplift, and uh, crustal stress change. I use the SOPAL program to develop a 2D thermal mechanical models. And in this model, there is a 
there is the upper crust, lower crust, mantle lithosphere, and the sublithospheric mantle. Um, this model is designed to study the effects of the delamination dynamics. So I place the lithosphere thinning region in the middle of the model plan to avoid the boundary effect. And uh, for delamination, these two end members, but sorry, these two key elements are important, acridge layer and uh, weak zones. And uh, for, because I assumed the thick crust after the continental thickening. And uh, so the chosen echo gel layer has a low viscosity and uh, positive density contrast when the underlying mental sphere. And uh, the age of the weak zones can initiate the delamination. The movie shows the delamination evolutions and including the surface level elevation and uh, material changes. The pink color is the mantle melting, and the blue color indicates the echo jet layer. But before delamination, the low elevations are results from the high density anomaly of the crust. So after the weak zone is removed, echo jet layer detaches from the crust, and which causes the crustal thickening above the detachment point. And the formation of the mantle melting and the growth of the elevations are along the delamination directions. After the lower lithosphere is removed, the surface elevation has little variations. However, the surface heat flow increases in the right thinning regions compared to the values in the left. And uh, you will see this model will run until 40 million years. And close to the, uh, the end of the model running, uh, the edge driven flow is um, at the ages, the ages of the thin regions. And this snapshot shows the weak zone removal and widespread mantle melting and the delaminating lithosphere from the left to the right. The viscosity profile shows the weak zone removal creating a low viscosity conduit. During delaminations, echo layer decouples from the crust because of the low viscosity. And uh, the weak rheology of the detachment is deformable, which showing the streaming delamination. And for the elevations, the surface uplift shows the rightward migration. And the time distance diagram shows the different surface expressions. The black dot is the location of the detachment point. The gray dot is the location of the mantle melting. And for the crustal thickness, it is calculated by the summation of the elevation and the mohole depth. For the surface horizontal strain rate, the positive value are the extension in blue color. Negative values are contraction in red color. So in this mo reference model, there are a few main features. First, the crustal thickening is above the detachment point. Second, the surface uplift is to the left of the detachment point. And the third one is the surface heat flow has a growth delay. Fourth, the mohole temperatures increases in the thinning regions. Five, the straining deformation usually shows the continuous pattern of the surface extension and which shows to the left of the detachment point. Lastly, the mantle melting at the edges can last for at least 20 million years. And if the lithosphere is hotter than the reference model, the removal event occurs the combination of the strainy delamination and the drips because of the hard and weak echo gel layer. And uh, as you can see these figures and uh, showing the material changes over time, it started with the localized drips, strainy delamination, and several drips to remove the lithosphere. And uh, this localized drips can cause a low uplift, less than 0.5 kilometer. For a hot vessel sphere, and uh, this surface expressions looks complicated than the reference model. First, uh, there are several drips and two episodes of the delamination to remove the vessel sphere. Second, the duration of the delamination is less than four many years whereas the duration of the drips is less than one million years. And the third one is the symmetric uplift is caused by the straining delamination. When the drips occurs at the 33 million years, um, there are the localized crustal thickening before drip and the localized uplift after drip. Lastly, the mantle melting in the thinning regions 
uh, can last for 40 million years, which shows low long lived mental melting. If the lithosphere is cooler than the reference model, and the uh, lithosphere has a stronger rheology and uh, high density. So this detachment is hard to deform and stretch, and uh, the removal event looks like the slab like delamations. Peeling an entire lithosphere away from the crust in a short time, less than 5 million years, will cause for high and uh, flat elevations. And this elevation shows, like, shows like the, looks like the plateau like uplift. And uh, the mantle melting at the edges of the thin regions is associated with the age driven convections. For a cool lithosphere, the small internal deformation of this detachment will cause the little crustal thickness variations. And uh, the sinking delaminating lithosphere will cause the surface substance to the right of the detachment point. At the 18 million years, uh, this sub substance is greater than one kilometers. And uh, the plateau-like uplift or rapid surface uplift is shows to the left of the detachment point. And uh, lastly, the because of the rapid removal event and it causes the surface strain rate change. At the distance of the 1500 kilometers, the surface extensions varying to the surface contractions is after the lithosphere removal. And uh, this surface contraction can last for 15 million years to the right of the detachment point. The take home message is that the ecogitized lower crust plays a crucial role in triggering delaminations. And uh, the lithosphere temperatures will affect the styles of the delaminations. The slab like delamination and the delaminations followed by drips can re remove the lithosphere less than five million years. Moreover, the surface expressions caused by the delaminations um, will, in fact, will distinguish the crustal strength. For a cool lithosphere, the, this removal event will cause the surface substance um, because of the large crustal stresses. And for the hot lithosphere, this removal event will cause the localized crustal thickening and the surface uplift with the little substance. Finally, this model result can, may imply to the, the de, have the delamination in the Western United States. In the Southern Sierra Nevada, the formation of the Chula Basins is associated with the delaminating lithosphere, which agrees with the seismic tomography and the negative gravity anatomy. In the Western edge of the Colorado Plateau, and the asymmetric surface uplift is related to the straining delaminations or the delamination with drips. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Taisha, for the good talk. Um, any questions? Uh, Russ, please go ahead. Sure. Um, thanks, Taishi. That was a really good talk. Lots of interesting stuff there. Um, I, I, I know there's a lot you could do with the models. I, I was just curious, have you played around much with the width of your horizontal delamination layer? You had quite a wide layer of it. So, um, I'd be interested, for example, if you bring it much smaller, does it change the results much? Does the process become inefficient effectively when you bring down the width of that zone or, or change appreciably what it looks like? Uh, sorry, can you, I missed your question. Sorry, one more time. It, okay. Yeah. So on the setup of your model, uh, if you go to your fourth slide, for example, you have yeah. that delamination zone, the dark blue zone. Yeah, so yeah. my question was, if you change the width of that zone as kind of an initial setup of the model, does it change appreciably your results? For example, I'm wondering if it becomes not vanishingly small, but as it becomes smaller, does it become less efficient to essentially drive a delamination process I, and some of the effects you see? I think that one don't affect because um, the key thing is you need to have these two elements like a the, in, the weak zones, because the weak zones will initiate the delaminations. So if the weak zones open, I test the width will be 50 kilometers. It allows to create the low viscosity conduit. And after that, your width for the echo layer is not, it doesn't matter because it will delaminate at, yeah, 
in the end. So it just depends on how, how, how long you want to let this area delaminate, I think. Yeah. So I think my model is quite the, the, the echo jelly is quite longer. <laughs> that, that is about 800 kilometers, I think, the, the length of echo jelly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think Phil has a question. Did I? <laughs> I thought that you raised hand, no? I clapped. I was just, I was clapping. For oh, OK, sorry. I can do it again if you want. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Any other questions? We have time. Uh, we have to, maybe for one, one more question. Uh, Clement? Yeah. Hi, Taishi. Uh, that was a very good talk. I, I have just a question about this weak zone. So what what would it be like, geologically speaking? What is it? like? Uh, because I see that it goes into the mental lithosphere to like a hundred kilometers depth. Like, do you have any idea what what, what is it? Like, uh... That is a good question. It depends on your study area. So the weak, the weak zones, if we want to apply to the geologic areas so we will think that will be like a suture zone or old volcanic arc because this kind of a job ge ge geologic features can decrease the viscosity so that's why we want to put this uh, wick zone here yeah <laughs> thank you uh, thank you all um, i think it's time to uh, end the session the first part of the session We'll be back in 20 minutes. Um, and there will be six more presentations. Um, and uh, we're waiting for you to, for the second part of the session.